The rhetoric around regional integration in Africa goes at least as far back as independence. So it relates to ideology, solidarity. And we know that cooperation between countries can help address challenges that go beyond their borders. Trade, infrastructure, food security issues, all of these require some form of, of regional approach. Although the logic is there, and while some progress is certainly being made, there is still some frustration with sort of the level of progress among both those people working in African organisations themselves who are trying to promote this agenda, but also the donors supporting them. Now, that of course isn't a unique uh, challenge to Africa, but it's certainly one that deserves more understanding. So at ECDPM we wanted to try and get into these regional organisations and understand what is it that drives them, but also what main constraints they face in carrying out their mandates. Looking at the organisations themselves, but especially looking at the politics within their member countries, but also the politics between member countries. So we looked into six regional organisations, the African Union, COMESA, EAC, ECOWAS, IGAD and SADEC. We summarised what we found in 10 key findings. The first one is that national interests from member states are really what drives regional organisations in promoting integration effectively. The distribution of power and resources within a country ultimately decides how decisions are taken between countries uh, and therefore what, what the regional organisation can do. The second finding is that those national interests themselves are influenced by foundational factors, long-run historical factors to do with the colonial experience or not for Ethiopia, uh, geographical factors such as being landlocked or an island state that really sort of line up where national interests are towards the regional economy. The third finding is that donors also play a key role. So while they clearly finance and support regional organisations and they've had an, an impact on for example peace and security operations or cross-border infrastructure construction, um, it can also raise challenges for regional organisations and there is a risk sometimes that donor support goes from supporting a regional agenda to actually steering the regional agenda. Now that then contributes to the fourth finding which is that leaders are often compelled to signal commitment to regional goals even when there's actually little political interest or capacity to really, to really follow through. Which then links to the fifth uh, finding which is that regional organisations can often end up setting up the sort of the forms or the institutional forms to encourage regional cooperation but in practice those often don't play the actual function that they're expected to. So for example, in the trade agenda, we have lots of agreements on paper, lots of commitments on paper, but just because you have a free trade agreement amongst a group of countries doesn't mean that it's going to be implemented. The sixth finding then is that it's not only about organisations. Personalities also play a key role. And that refers to leaders in the organisation who can shape how processes work, but also about technical staff as well as political leaders within the country. The more powerful a country is, the more it can drive or block regional integration. Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya are clear cases, as well as Ethiopia, where the agenda setting and especially implementation is most likely at a regional level when it's on their terms. The eighth finding is that regional integration really needs the structure in place, but especially it needs demand. And we saw very weak demand from civil society organisations or businesses really holding governments to account in terms of implementing regional commitments. If political cost is low, that means there's very little consequences for not implementing. And the ninth finding is that each sector, like trade, security or infrastructure, has its own set of institutions, interests and incentives when it comes to regional cooperation. So in some, the costs of inaction are clear, for example, in peace and security. But in others, the, there's very limited information on the costs or benefits from inaction, so the incentives are very different. And finally, unforeseen factors like natural disasters, elections or revolutions can suddenly play a role by either triggering progress or actually suddenly blocking regional progress that had previously been seen. So our conclusion is that instead of looking at regional integration as a technocratic linear process, we need to recognise that it is highly political. By understanding why things are the way they are, we can better think about reforms and support mechanisms that are therefore better adapted and can help regional organisations genuinely achieve their objective.